Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to what I'm confident will be a most engaging and informative discussion on the topic of space exploration, past and present. I'm Prabhat Jela, provost at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And at this time, I have the pleasure of introducing a visionary and transformative leader who has served as president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute for 20 years. Allow me to tell you a little bit about her extraordinary career. Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson, PhD, is the 18th president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, the oldest technological research university in the United States. Described by Time Magazine as perhaps the ultimate role model for women in science, Dr. Jackson has held senior leadership positions in academia, government, industry, and research. A theoretical physicist, Dr. Jackson holds a BS in physics and a PhD in theoretical elementary particle physics, both from MIT. In September 2014, United States President Barack Obama appointed Dr. Jackson as the co-chair of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board, where she served until January 2017. Dr. Jackson also served on the U.S. Secretary of State International Security Advisory Board from 2011 to 2017, and the U.S. Secretary of Energy Advisory Board from 2013 to 2017. From 2009 to 2014, Dr. Jackson served on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, also known as PCAST. As part of PCAST, she was co-chair of the President's Innovation and Technology Advisory Committee. Before taking the helm at Rensselaer, Dr. Jackson was chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission from 1995 to 1999. In her role, Dr. Jackson conceived and promulgated risk-informed performance-based regulation and created a new planning, budgeting, and performance management process. During her tenure at the NRC, Dr. Jackson spearheaded the formation of the International Nuclear Regula Regulators Association and served as its chairman from 1997 to 1999. Dr. Jackson is a life member of the MIT Corporation and a former vice chair of the Board of Regents of the Smithsonian Institution. In October 2017, she was named Regent Emerita of the Smithsonian Institution. She currently serves on the boards of major corporations that include Federal Express and IBM, and she's a former member of the board at the World Economic Forum USA, Medtronic, the New York Stock Exchange, Keycorp, AT&T, Marathon Oil, U.S. Steel, and Sealed Air Corporation. Dr. Jackson is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, the American Philosophical Society, and the Council on Foreign Relations. She is an international fellow of the British Royal Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Physical Society, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, of which she also served as past president. Dr. Jackson holds 55 honorary doctoral degrees. In 2018, Dr. Jackson was awarded the W.E.B. Du Bois Medal from the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University. The medal honors those who have made significant contributions to African and African American history and culture, and more broadly, individuals who advocate for intercultural understanding and human rights in an increasingly global and interconnected world. In 2007, describing her as a national treasure, the National Science Board selected Dr. Jackson as the recipient of the Vannevar Bush Award for, and I quote, a lifetime of achievements in scientific research, education, and senior statesmanlike contributions to public policy, close quotes. In 2016, United States President Barack Obama awarded Dr. Jackson the National Medal of Science. This is the nation's highest honor in science and engineering. Please welcome the 18th president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, the Honorable Shirley Ann Jacks. Well, good afternoon, and thank all of you for coming. Welcome to the start of what I am sure will be a delightful reunion and homecoming weekend. Now, this fall, we are celebrating a number of milestones here at Rensselaer. Uh, I'm pleased to say that September 24th was the 20th anniversary of my inauguration as president of this great institution. 
And for me, the last 20 years have been joyful, challenging, and productive. And for Rensselaer, with the uh, work and support and effort of, of so many, uh, they have been transformative. And we are very proud of what we have accomplished, and I will tell you more about some of our more recent accomplishments at the State of the Institute on Saturday morning. But this afternoon, we are celebrating a different milestone, the 50th anniversary of the landing of humans on the moon, the Apollo 11 mission on January 16th, 1969. The Apollo program was one of the most audacious feats of science and engineering in human history. So of course, Rensselaer people were at the fore. And chief among them was George M. Lowe. George Lowe was born near Vienna, Austria in 1926 and fled Nazi rule with his family in 1938, settling in the United States. At Rensselaer as an undergraduate, he switched from mechanical to aeronautical engineering and joined the Delta Phi fraternity where he became president of the Rensselaer chapter. His education was interrupted by World War II. He served as a topographic draftsman in the US Army from 1944 to 1946 and earned a pilot's license. In 1945, he became a US citizen. He received his bachelor's degree from Rensselaer in 1948 and his master's in 1950. In 1949, he joined the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, where he specialized in experimental and theoretical research in the fields of heat transfer, boundary layer flow, flows, and internal aerodynamics, as well as issues in space exploration, such as orbit calculations, reentry paths, and rendezvous procedures. During the summer and autumn of 1958, he helped with the planning for a new agency, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, where he was named Chief of Manned Spaceflight. He chaired the Manned Lunar Program Planning Group, whose analysis, including cost and schedule estimates, gave President John F. Kennedy the confidence in May 1961 to commit the US to landing a man on the moon before the end of that decade. And George Lowe was critical to the planning and execution of the projects Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. And when a tragic fire in Apollo 1 command, the command module killed three astronauts on the launch pad during a test, George Lowe was asked to oversee the redesign and testing of the Apollo spacecraft, and clearly he was successful. He was appointed deputy administrator of NASA in 1969 and served as acting administrator from 1970 to 1971, negotiating an agreement with our great rival in space, the then Soviet Union, which laid the foundation for the Apollo Soyuz flight in 1975 and other joint space projects. He left NASA to become the 14th president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in 1976. Because of his seminal achievements in the Apollo program and in space more broadly, George Lowe was awarded the US Presidential of Freedom shortly before his death in 1984. President Lowe was the inspiration for what has become a grand Rensselaer tradition in space one that truly reminds all of us why science and engineering are so exciting and so important. And we have a short video for you that summarizes some of this history. Please. Here, men from the planet Earth, first step foot upon the moon. Rensselaer has a very strong history with NASA. George Lowe, who was the 14th president of Rensselaer, essentially was the operations director of running the Apollo program. He led the redesign of the Apollo capsule after there was this unfortunate fire and in the end created the uh, successful pathway for man to land on the moon. 
So that's a very important set of uh, milestones. We've had uh, a number of alums who were astronauts. My old university, their RPI, it is really, uh, it's just a great a day. A number of our alums uh, work at the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Caltech and have had a very important role in designing the Mars rovers from the actual rovers themselves to, to how you get them to land on the surface of Mars. We also have had faculty members here at Rensselaer who have designed experiments uh, to be done in space, experiments on the International Space Station. And so all of these are ways that Rensselaer has played a very direct and seminal role. We're starting to build up a picture of the Milky Way one star at a time, and we're starting to reach understanding of where all of those 200 billion stars are. So what really excites me uh, about space imaging is what it's going to enable for future space exploration missions. Space debris is a huge and growing problem. We envision a day where we could send up an entire flock or squadron of Oscars that would work jointly after going after large collections of debris or very large pieces of debris. My father always said, aim for the stars so you at least reach the treetops and at any rate you'll get off the ground. Who knows where we'll end up, but that's the whole point, isn't it? This afternoon, we are very excited to have two guests who will help us to look back to the triumph of Apollo 11 and forward to the future of space exploration and research. So please allow me to introduce them to you. Now, we cannot claim our first guest as a Rensselaer graduate, but he is indeed a great friend to Rensselaer, and we awarded him an honorary doctorate of engineering in 2008 for his married achievements. He received his bachelor's degree in electrical science from the United States Naval Academy and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the US Marine Corps. He became a pilot and flew more than 100 combat missions during the Vietnam War. In 1977, he earned a master's degree in systems management from the University of Southern California. In 1978, he was assigned to the United States Naval Test Pilot School and completed his training in 1979, testing a variety of ground attack aircraft until his selection as an astronaut candidate in 1980. He made four space shuttle flights, with two of them as commander. Returning to the Marine Corps, he rose to the rank of Major General in 1998. In 2009, President Barack Obama appointed him as the 12th Administrator of NASA, where he served until January 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming General Charles Bolden, Jr. Our next panelist is managing director of both the Global Cardiovascular Innovation Center and the NIH Health Center for Accelerated Innovations at the Cleveland Clinic. He is an expert in product and market development for breakthrough healthcare technologies, including in diagnostic and interventional cardiology, interventional radiology and neuroradiology, stroke treatment, and image-guided surgery. Before jo joining the Cleveland Clinic, he concentrated on startups and early stage companies, serving in both senior management positions and as a consultant. He earned a bachelor's degree in natural science from Johns Hopkins University, a master's degree in physiology from the Medical College of Wisconsin, and a master's degree in technical communication from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in 1978. Our guest and his family donated the papers and artifacts on display in the George M. Lowe Gallery in the Lowe Center for Industrial Innovation. 
Now, I urge all of you to have a look at the exhibit there, which offers wonderful insights into George Lowe's contribution to space exploration and to Rensselaer. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Mark Lowe. So let us begin our discussion with George Lowe's re-engineering of the Apollo spacecraft after the tragic death of three astronauts trapped inside a burning capsule on the launch pad in 1967 with a hatch that could not be opened against the internal pressure, an accident that George Lowe believed never should have happened. During the rebuilding process, he considered every one of the two million parts in the command module as a potential failure in space. And he assembled a configuration control board to consider how every one of the 1,341 engineering changes that were approved would affect other systems. Now, the board included the leaders of every branch of the Apollo management and supply chain, as well as astronauts. And not the least achievement here was the fact that George Lowe persuaded them all to work together. So Mark, now, you were a teenager during this period. So it'd be interesting for you to share with us what you remember uh, from this time. And also, what is it about your father's character that allowed him to lead this effort so successfully? But before you get to that, how did you escape space? Aha. <laughs> so, I grew up in a space environment, right. and everything around me had to do with, you know, trying to reach the moon. And my brother, who uh, followed in my dad's footsteps, followed in those footsteps, and he became an astronaut. And he flew, and was a contemporary of Charlie's here, you know, in the shuttle program. So what happened to me? <laughs> Yeah, what happened? I had the opportunity <laughs> when I was at, in Houston and, and when uh, we were uh, in association with the uh, NASA Scuba Diving Club to learn about diving physiology. Mm. And that's what kind of took me in the opposite direction. So I was looking down when my brother and my dad were both looking up. Now, I don't know whether that was 60s radicalism and, <laughs> uh, you know, rebutting, you know, the, the, what your parents are trying to teach you. I don't think so. But uh, it, it, that became an interest of mine, and I, you know, learned how to dive, and I studied uh, diving physiology. My master's thesis is in decompression sickness, and that led me into my career in the medical device industry and on into what I'm doing now at Cleveland Clinic. Well, human physiology in space is a big Very important. And an example of that is that um, David, I have a picture of David doing ultrasound imaging on his heart on space shuttle using a device that was developed by the company that I was working for in diagnostic ultrasound. So there's all kinds of ties. So tell us about your dad as who he was as you saw him. So the times, you know, um, we were at the time of the fire. It was, you know, definitely tragic uh, shock to, to everybody. And if you know uh, where we were living in Houston, uh, everybody was involved in the program. All of your neighbors, all of your friends and schools, parents, uh, were all working around and in this program to try to reach uh, the moon, and so it was just a tremendous shock. And so Dad's position, you know, prior to the fire was as deputy uh, director of the uh, center. He was always working long hours. He was out of the house before we woke up. He often came home after, most of the time came home after the kids had eaten. After the fire, 
we saw much less of him. And it was not just meetings and long hours at JSC, or, uh, but it was on planes to Downey, California, where the command uh, module was being built. It was on planes to Bethpage, Long Island, where the lunar module was being built. And so he was going cross country and he was managing uh, everything. And so I didn't see very much of him during that time. Um, but uh, to the other part of the question about, you know, what was it that came forward that, that helped to move things along? And I think a couple of uh, realizations really set in at that time. One of them was they became mantras. Uh, for him and, and I think you know, for many of us. Pay attention to detail and ask the right questions. And, and that's how he approached understanding what were the uh, things that needed to be changed, how can they and should they be changed, and how can we control that the changes that we're making in one area don't have negative effects and consequences on something else, which is, you mentioned the configuration control board. How do you control all of that? And so he managed that process. And as you say, I think through approach, um, was able to get people to come to consensus on next steps. You know, I often speak of uh, intersecting vulnerabilities with cascading consequences. And uh, your father understood that to a fairly well and manage that, which is why two years later we managed to, to land on the moon. By the way, parenthetically, I had the great honor to uh, get to know Neil Armstrong. I was on the board of U.S. Steel, and he was a very humble man. He never gave out uh, autographs, but because I was on the board, when I left the board, you know, they always give you a Tiffany platter, and every director signs it. And he signed it, so. <laughs> so General Bolden. Yes, ma'am. And I'm going to call you Charlie after this. Thank you. Right. Tell us how you as a former astronaut and, and former head of NASA, looking through the lens of the past, see the effort that took place at that time. Yeah. And, and let me add this part in terms of something that you and I both uh, understood. You know, how did George Lowe's approach influence efforts to recover, for example, from the Challenger and the Columbia shuttle disasters. Because you and I both lost a dear friend uh, on the Challenger when the Challenger blew up, uh, Dr. Ronald McNair. So maybe you could talk. You know, Mark and I have talked about his, uh, his father. I never met Dr. Lowe. And in, for anybody in here, particularly young people, I'll tell you a lesson I learned by not meeting Dr. Lowe. If there's anybody in your life you want to meet, go do it. Um, seriously, because uh, the guy that hired me into the astronaut office was a gentleman by the name of um, George Abbey. George idolized Dr. Lowe, as did many people in leadership at NASA. And when we lost Challenger, I think most of the people who had worked for Dr. Lowe uh, understood that you've got to do exactly what, what he had us do after Apollo 1. And um, we took the shuttle apart. I mean, we literally looked at every piece of it and how it had been designed and what decisions we had made and what did we do that we wish we had done differently. So we used the same process, the same procedure. The uh, Configuration Control Board lives today. That's a legacy of Dr. Lowe. And, and, and I, you know, when you look at, I hate the term, new space, but, but we use it all the time. When you look at a differentiation between new space and old space, if you want to put them that way, I think one of the big differences is the emphasis in classic old space legacy companies who still live with the same guidance of Dr. Lowe, that configuration is critically important and configuration control is critically important. Whereas some of the new space companies recognize the fact that if you want to go fast, you can't do all that stuff. And so we'll accept the risk. We can talk about We're that. We're going to come back to yeah, that. Yeah, but, um, but I think his legacy of leadership and, and, and engineering expertise lives on today. An another thing with Steve sitting here is grandson, who's also a Marine. Uh, he, he doesn't know it, but, but in becoming a Marine officer uh, and living the way that Marines live, 
he kind of did things the way his dad did. You know, if you read about him, uh, when Mark said he was out in Downey, he, he was in the plants. Uh, he met with the workers, and he let people know he was just a normal guy to people who, who met him was what I heard. Um, and, and I think that's kind of like they teach you as, as a young Marine officer. You eat last, you take care of your people, and they'll take care of you. And I think that's kind of the, the legacy that, that George Lowe left in the organization. And that's the reason he was able to get people who would not agree on anything come together and compromise and agree on what took us to the moon. So Mark, you, you built your career in the, the management, marketing, and development of, of medical innovations, uh, particularly, as you've noted, and within the cardiovascular space. Now again, lives are at stake. Um, and you know, I actually, again, had the privilege of being on the board of Medtronic, so I appreciate how you've spent your, mm -hmm. your, your career. So again, lives are at stake. So how is the best approach to safety in your field similar to that, or what you think uh, what goes on in space exploration? I think that they're very, very closely aligned. You know, both aerospace and medical are highly regulated industries. And for, to get a medical product into the market, you have to design and manufacture under controls. You have to have regulatory approval, and there are so many different you know, guidances and, and restrictions and, and uh, approaches that you need to follow, classifications and everything else. And we were talking about this earlier about failure mode analysis and how that becomes a key component in aerospace and how it is a key component in uh, the, the medical industry. Now, in the medical industry, we have a little bit of an easier path, opportunity or, or, or path in that we can test devices, uh, preclinical animal models. We can do early safety studies in a few patients. We can scale it up, and we can do more studies in uh, larger patient populations and different types of patient populations. And it's all under you know, medical guidance and control. And so you're not at risk of a catastrophic failure in the system. Um, now, I think we know with some of the you know, things that we're hearing about vaping today and other kinds of things, there's a lot of unknowns still out there that we have to you know, figure out. But the approaches in aerospace and uh, space flight and in the medical uh, field where safety is of paramount importance is very much the same. And I remember seeing a clip of my dad when he first came back to RPI. And he, he made the comment, he says, he didn't know of many areas other than aerospace and medical where that uh, consideration was as important. I might add nuclear, but other than that, <laughs> I, sure I totally agree. Absolutely. So Charlie, you know, there was a famous exchange in 1962 between James Webb, who was a NASA administrator from 1961 to 1968. He's also a Marine. I'm coming there. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a and, good and, theme for the night. Right. <laughs> and of course, you know, President John F. Kennedy wanted uh, Webb to make the moon landing the first priority of NASA. You know. While, so, you know, Marines are very focused, right? But, but Webb argued for a more balanced program uh, designed to expand the science of space. And President Kennedy apparently was very clear, and he said, and this is the quote, I'm not that interested in space. That's the quote. And as the president saw it, the only reason to spend large amounts of taxpayer money on NASA was to beat the Soviets to the moon and to prove that communism was not, the, was not the, the superior system. So what did you hear from President Obama? Um, let me go back to your, because it's really important for all of us to understand that story that Dr. Jackson just told, because I'm constantly asked, what, why can't we just go back to the moon you know, now? What, what's taken us so long? 
And, you, and it is really critical for us as Americans to understand that we had something that hopefully we'll never have again, which is a geopolitical imperative. We had, a, we had a, you know, an enemy that we had to defeat. And that was the position that President Kennedy took. Um, I was very fortunate. I never had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with President Obama. I don't think I would have. Um, but uh, unlike John Kennedy, who I did not know, uh, my impression of President Obama, although he was an attorney, he was passionate about science. And he you was. know this. He was. Um, he was interested in space. And um, I remember... You know, when I, my first time I met him, because I was not on the campaign, I didn't even know him, um, it was a 25-minute meeting, and I listened most of the time, but it was a, it was a meeting about his vision for, for the nation and how he wanted to really inspire kids to be interested in science and engineering again. And he wanted, he wanted us to continue to pick up the journey far beyond low-Earth orbit and even beyond the moon. So... You know, the, the kind of direction I got from him all the time was think big, um, let's, let's go beyond the moon and keep going. Uh, and and it, was, it was very easy to run an agency that was supposed to do research and development and the things like that when the, you know, when the president's kind of got your back and, and really pushing for it. So for me, it was easy. Now, even before the presidency of John Kennedy, uh, President Dwight uh, Eisenhower was not as well in the least mm. interested in human spaceflight. But George Lowe understood the value of uh, continuing to explore human mission to the moon so that, quote unquote, there was something in the files uh, should the political winds shift, as indeed they did. So... Did you secret away or protect any <laughs> projects that were out of political favor or maybe now during um, your time as a NASA administrator? Actually, we did. Um, and the one that, that is my favorite is the relationship between the U.S., NASA, as the representative for civil space, and China. Um, the president, again, being a visionary, uh, sent me to China in 2010 to visit with the Chinese space program and find out what the feasibility of, was of collaborating with the Chinese in human space flight. And I took Bill Gerstenmaier, who was at the time the head of human space flight, and Peggy Whitson, who was the chief of the astronaut office, first woman to hold that position and, and still the, the, the world's record holder for a lot of things in space. Um, but we were very impressed with what the Chinese were doing. Um, what we did was we took uh, a copy of the international docking standards that we had developed among the partner nations in the International Space Station and gave them to the Chinese to evaluate, to take a look and, you know, see what they thought, hoping that they might come back, but also hoping that they would copy them and decide to use those as, inter as the standards for their docking mechanism such that whenever the Congress of the United States came to their senses, and remove the prohibition against NASA working with China, that their vehicles would be compatible with ours. And it, it, I cannot say that, it, that they are today, but I would be willing to bet that any Chinese spacecraft that's built to go to space has the international docking adapter on it, and, uh, and it will be compatible with the International Space Station or any other spacecraft that's built. So kind of protecting that ability to couple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so Mark, clearly... Um, your father was, as he described himself, actually, and, and it's consistent with what Charlie said, uh, was, a, as he called it, a dirty hands engineer, <laughs> but clearly a visionary and a, a particularly effective leader, you know, because of all you described in the ability to bring together many different parties, whether from contractors to the Congress, which is a real feat, um, to make that Apollo program a success. Now, how important to your father you believe was the education he received here at Rensselaer for his subsequent career, his career at NASA, and, and you know, what of it shaped him, you think? I think it was everything. Mm -hmm. I, and he, you know, acknowledged that. I was a, uh, there's a plaque up in the gallery that's a quote from my mother that says he attributes everything he learned and every approach that he took to what he learned here at RPI. And, and I commented about this actually uh, at the uh, dedication of the CII 
you know, many, many years ago. And I'm looking past you now to that seal for RPI and the words on it, knowledge and thoroughness. So it's pay attention to detail and ask the right questions, which became how he approached everything that he did, are also encapsulated in those two words that were here. I presume they were here <laughs> back then. <laughs> But what he learned here in terms of a practical, solid approach to tackling problems. And I think this university is stellar and perhaps unique in that respect. Uh, guided everything that he did going forward. So you're a Rensselaer alum as well. Mm -hmm. what, what made you decide to get a technical communication degree? That's a good I'm question. Here. So I was at a crossroads. I told you that I had been interested in underwater physiology. I had been doing some research in that area. But I didn't really think that there was going to be much of a career in being an underwater physiology researcher. And I had finished my master's degree, and I was talking with my dad, who was here at RPI. And I told him, you know, maybe, you know, the opportunity to, to dabble in a lot of different areas and to understand a lot of different things and communicate that to others. So I was thinking about scientific journalism. I was thinking about some way of, of getting into uh, the opportunity to still learn a lot and then maybe even teach a little bit about it. And he says, you know, we've got this program here in technical communication. And that might be something to help you, you know, if that's the path that you want to take. And so I looked at it. and. 30 credit hours, one year, no thesis, okay? <laughs> no thesis. Uh, that sounds pretty good. You know, pretty good program for getting, uh, uh, you know, a good credential. Um, kind of free room and board. So I moved back in, lived in the president's house with my, with my parents. So that sounded pretty good. So I came to RPI for a year. And, and I have to tell you, it seems like it was kind of serendipitous, mm -hmm. but what I learned here in technical communication was really, really seminal to an approach to doing many things in what I've done since. The side of product development uh, is product marketing, is, is what many call upstream marketing. It's looking at what the needs are. It's trying to qualify those needs and then translate those into specifications that ultimately get developed into products. And it is very much projecting out and understanding the user and then bringing that back into how you design. Communication is the same thing. It's projecting out how your message should be aligned to whom you're communicating with and being able to adjust as you get the feedback. From, from that. So fundamentals of communication were translated into fundamentals of marketing, which were translated into fundamentals of product development and design. And I thank RPI for that. So Charlie, you know, getting back to the question about cooperation, you know, although the original rationale uh, for the Apollo program was, you know, proving preeminence over the Soviets, uh, George Lowe spearheaded cooperation with the Soviets on the uh, Apollo Soyuz test project, which was a great moment of detente. And we now seem to be, and you alluded to it, uh, that you hope it's not happening, but we now seem to be perhaps entering a new Cold War with China, which, as you know, in January became the first nation to land a spacecraft on the far side of the moon. So. Was Congress right to discourage NASA from working with China? Absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. Still wrong. Are you sure? I'm absolutely <laughs> positive. And it, you know, it's, it, uh, here, here's, my, here's my point. I, I know you have a question there somewhere, right. but, but since you opened this window. Um, and Steve, Steve you, can, you can attest to this. I spent, as I used to explain to my, the chairman of my House Appropriations Committee, Frank Wolf, who became a very good friend of mine, from congressman from Virginia. He, he believed that we could isolate the Chinese. 
And by isolation, we would, we would force them to come to, to reason that the things that we thought should be done will be done. And I said, you know, I, I appreciate that, but I spent 34 years of my life as a Marine uh, working with people I frequently did not like, thought were not good people, but engaging them and giving them an opportunity to see how we live, what we do, how we think, and trying to influence them to follow the way that we were. I, I don't, you know, as I said, I didn't know Dr. Lowe, but everything I heard about him was an influencer. I did, I did read several people said he was a pragmatist and not an ideologue. And uh, one of the issues that we have today in, in, uh, in the space program is the rise of uh, ideologues and um, people who believe, you know, if I just put all my money here, it'll happen and it'll happen real quick. It's hard to get to space. And so you, you have to be a pragmatist about it, and I think you have to engage people and convince them that what you want to do is the right thing to do. So then you wouldn't say that we're quite at another Sputnik moment? Ahead? No, as a kind of galvanizing moment. And, 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 and what's your thought about the proposed Space Force as a sixth I, uh, military uh, branch? I, I will say this, which is next to nothing, um, it, because I, st even though I am no longer um, in a, the NASA administrator, I still feel that, that I wear the hat of the head of civil space, and that's my background, and it's inappropriate for me to, to, um, to try to second guess and advise the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of the Air Force and anybody else that wants to be their advisors as to what course they should take for the nation and national security. But... Um, I, my hope is it will come up with the right decision. I, the question I ask myself is what problem are we trying to solve? So that, that's, it's good to know what problem you're trying to solve. Mark, your brother, G. David Lowe, also was an astronaut, in fact, flew, flew uh, three space shuttle missions. Um, can you tell us a little bit about him? Sure. So David's the middle of five, and... Uh, four years younger than me, and he was always kind of a serious guy, and, and um, I'm not sure I would say he was studious, but you know, always a serious guy. Um, went off to college, got a bachelor's degree, but wasn't satisfied with that, so I got another bachelor's degree. And along about this time, he started to articulate that he had a vision of following in the footsteps and going to space. And so he's one of the most dedicated and hardworking guys I ever knew next to my dad. And uh, so I think he got a lot of that, which, you know, I was rebelling and going in a different direction. But um, So David went on. He got a master's degree in aeroastro, he went to work at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and he um, was accepted into the astronaut program. And as you say, he had a, a you know, successful career of uh, flying on three space shuttle missions. He worked in Washington, D.C. on some of the early planning for the International Space Station. And then he went out into the private sector and did some of the initial work on what has become the commercial side of space with orbital sciences and the uh, commercial uh, transport uh, supply. Um, so he was always a head down, focused guy. But he was also a family man and he had three great kids and they were all young when he passed away. I uh, was you know, interested in lacrosse and he was coaching lacrosse and so you know, he had that side of him, but when it was time to get busy, David knew how to do that. Charlie, you knew him. You know, I, well, and he, and was, he was an incredible human being, to be quite honest. He was, um, he, just as Mark says, always serious, but he had fun, you know, loved to have fun. Beautiful family and, uh, and everything, and it just kind of took our breath away when he passed. So, yeah. Lost him far too soon. So, you know, I was uh, interviewed um, over the summer, you know, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary, um, because George Lowe was the, the president. 
And so I talked about uh, what I call the bookends of the, the Apollo program, the whole overall space program. And you know, the, uh, Charlie, the 200 and 2016 movie, uh, Hidden Figures, uh, painted a picture of segregation and discrimination at NASA, right? And in the early 1960s in particular, but it also painted a picture of opportunity for mathematically gifted African-American women, who, you know, the human computers, uh, who manually perform these calculations, these, some would say, life or death calculations for the missions that sent the, the first Americans into space. And now so much was at stake, perhaps even the future of democracy, that talent couldn't be denied. So, but it took until 1983, I think, before the first African-American astronaut made it to space. So tell us about your experiences of the culture yeah. of NASA as a pioneering astronaut, but then as head of NASA, how you work to shape that culture. When I got to Houston um, in 1980, um, I was fortunate in the three other African-Americans who had, had already been there, Ron McNair, Guy Bluford, and Fred Gregory. So, so the trail had been blazed, um, but it was still challenging, to, so to speak. Um, we brought Mae Jemison in later, who became the first African-American woman to fly in space. Uh, NASA has always made an effort to, to be sort of a, on the vanguard of um, equal opportunity and everything, and we struggle, even today. Uh, when I was a NASA administrator, um, I considered myself, in fact, everybody in the agency knew that I was the diversity champion for the agency because I, I believe that if we didn't work at it from the top down, it doesn't happen. Um, the agency managed to do uh, much better than many, if not most other federal agencies in, in attracting people of all walks of life, uh, as well as all countries. We, you know, we're, everybody wants to come to work for NASA. But it, 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 my belief then and my belief now is that, that um, it takes hard work and you can never, you know, you can never stop uh, trying to get people to understand that, that we're all the same. 99% of us is all the same. And there's that one little percent that we focus on all the time. Um, but what was so great about Hidden Figures, and I tell people it's, it's, it's a movie not for black people, not for black women, or any, it's a movie about humanity. And, and one of the pieces that we miss, you know, and Mary Vaughn going, getting, uh, going through court to be able to go to school to become an engineer um, is the fact that there were also white women exactly. who were in other buildings at Langley because it wasn't just black women had twice the difficulty, but white women were not accepted either. And so they were among the human computers. And as always happens in, I believe, in, in civil rights movements, is when you, when one group moves forward, everybody moves forward. And for those of you who saw the movie, if you didn't go see it, you may remember that um, when, when one of the three characters, lead characters, becomes a supervisor, recognized as a supervisor for the first time, officially, the one request that her white boss makes of her is, don't leave the other women behind. And she goes into the other building where the white computer scientists were or mathematicians, and she brings them all in and takes everybody forward. And uh, so I, that's why I think it's just an absolutely fantastic movie. I think NASA tries to do that uh, even today, but, but we are not anywhere close uh, to being where we need to be. You know, Mark, because your father wasn't the type to, you know, so deliberately seek the spotlight. Uh, and, and here we are at the 50th anniversary, and it's why it's important that we're having this discussion today. The reason I talked about hidden figures is obviously these women who were the quote unquote human computers who did a lot of the underlying calculations that, you know, undergirded these shots, these including uh, Katherine Johnson's work on, you know, how you kind of bring the window to couple the lunar landing module back to the command module. But equally so, you know, I've always felt that even though we know a great deal, 
about your father that many people didn't fully get to know who he was and how seminal and important what he did was. And so I called him a hidden figure as well. Mm. And so it is important that we kind of understand the full spectrum of what it takes to do great things. And so that's why it's a, it's a particular honor and pleasure to be you know, talking. If, if I can interrupt, Dr. Jackson, Frank Borman, uh, you know, and Frank Borman made the statement once, and, right. and he said, if there is one person who is most responsible for the success of Apollo, it, it's George Lowe. That he was the one person that nobody outside of NASA knew but were it not for George Lowe, um, you know, we probably wouldn't have recovered from Apollo 1. Right. Uh, we definitely would not have gotten to the moon. Right. And so. Well, Neil Armstrong said the same thing. Yeah. So. May I make one comment? Sure. I had an opportunity um, at the 40th or 50th anniversary at NASA Glenn to chat for a few minutes with Neil Armstrong and also with John Glenn. It was great. And I just introduced myself, you know, it says, I'm George Lowson. And out of his mouth, it's my favorite engineer. So okay. that kind of regard, you know, is, is very meaningful. Well, you know, I wish I had, had gotten to know him because, you know, I think in some ways that I may indirectly owe my own presidency, uh, Brent Sleer, to, uh, to your father. You know, after he, you know, passed away in office at a very untimely and young age of 58. You know, Rensselaer had five leaders in 14 years after that. And it, you know, seemed adrift without him. And so by 1999 or 1998, actually, the Board of Trustees uh, was looking for a change agent. And I think hearkening back to President Lowe, uh, the board, as they did with him, was willing to choose someone who had leadership experience but was not from the classical academic path. Now, you were here as a grad student mm -hmm. during your father's tenure. And when I came, people said, you know, he was a tough act to follow, which is true. So what made him that proverbial tough act to follow? That's a tough question for me because, you know, I... I... <laughs> You know, it's, it's hard for me to say what it was about him, you know, sitting next to the current president of the university. But. Well, I'll tell you a story <laughs> in a minute. You know, I, I told you I'd ask you a hard question. That's, so that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think he had a couple things going for him when he came. You know, he was not from academia, and I think that that was a, um, a perspective that didn't, you know, he wasn't limited by any expectations probably, you know, didn't know what he didn't know about how difficult it was to, could be helpful. <laughs> to bring all of the various perspectives, constituencies together in, in this kind of an organization. But he, you know, through, you know, what he had done at NASA to be able to marshal uh, engineers and manufacturers and government to, you know, get onto, you know, a, a path. I think he was able to deal individually and to be able to, res to identify and to communicate individually. And by doing that, to be able to bring people together. And he was always, you know, a straight shooter. And so I don't think that there was any question about ulterior motive or things like that. And, uh, you know, for him, it was, he was coming home. You know, this is where he went to school. And I think that was some, one of the first words in this uh, introductory press conference is, it's good to be home. So there was a lot that he had going for him that I think enabled him to, you know, be successful here. It certainly wasn't without, you know, challenges. And uh, you'd navigate those. But he was, I think, we were talking earlier today, I see um, Roger Mike in the audience from Delta Phi, and we were talking about the gallery. And, uh, you know, Dad was, you know, very much uh, involved with the students, very much involved with student activities, you know, attended every hockey game. Um, he was very involved with, you know, the uh, professional staff, he was very involved with the academic staff. 
And I think that by working and being one with all, it enabled him to uh, you know, move the institution forward as he did. Well, you obviously had special, a special parent in, in your father, but, but let me tell you a story. Okay. You had a special mother. Yeah. So no doubt. when I came to Rensselaer, everyone said, well, you know, you have a tough act to follow. Now, they weren't talking about the most recent president. They were talking about George Lowe. So um, I had lunch one day. I met Mary R. Lowe. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a little nervous there talking with her. This was, you know, very early in my tenure. So I said, well, you know, Mrs. Lowe, I know I have really, you know, big shoes to fill. You know, it's really a tough act to follow. So this is what she said to me. She said, well, you know, Dr. Jackson, she says, you have your own shoes. And she says, you'll walk in your own shoes and you'll make your own difference. Don't worry about what George Lowe was. That's your mother. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but she would tell the same thing to us, you know. Mm -hmm. And we, five kids, had, you know, the freedom to go any direction we wanted to go, uh, as long as we didn't get in trouble doing it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Charlie, you know, the current NASA administrator, Jim Bridenstine, has said that politics rather than technology represents the greatest obstacle to space exploration. You know, President George W. Bush's Project Constellation was intended to return humans to the moon by 2020. And after the Augustine Commission found uh, the scheduling, found scheduling and budgetary problems, President Obama canceled Constellation, focusing instead on asteroids as a step to Mars. And the Trump administration has turned back to the moon. And Vice President Pence announced this year that a human mission would occur there within the next five years. But then President Trump tweeted that NASA should not be talking about the moon, but about Mars. And, you know, I've not even mentioned the vicissitudes of congressional funding. So how does NASA manage, plan and manage complex missions uh, that are clearly multi-year missions against such uncertainty? And, and what should be the next steps on the road to Mars? Um, I, think we're, I think we're on the right road to Mars, to be quite honest. Uh, th this may sound strange, but I am relatively happy with the trajectory on which NASA is going because it hasn't changed. Uh, now, that may sound strange to some people. You used the term that President Trump decided we were going back to the moon, meaning, you know, as if the Obama administration wasn't. Uh, the trajectory that was actually started many presidents ago was back to the moon, on to Mars, and then see what comes next. But maybe a few asteroids along. But, but nobody talked about asteroids the way that, that President Obama did for a very good reason. And, uh, and he, he was answering or challenging us to... Everybody now wonders what we're going to do about the next asteroid that comes whizzing by a little bit too close. And so he challenged us to do things like grand challenges and the like um, to find out how we protect the planet right. against that. And so it wasn't really, you know, we're going to go to an asteroid instead of, but it was that we are going to use asteroids as a stepping stone. I, I think it was, unfortunately, when you, look at, when you look at the solar system, you know, you're going to Mars first, right. and then you're going to an asteroid. But, you know, but, but we might catch one that's in one of these elliptical orbits and, and do that. But I, I think we're on the right trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Jim Bridenstine has one thing right. Politics is tough. Um, however, George Lowe had it absolutely right that you've got to be a pragmatist okay. and uh, you've got to be a communicator. Uh, you know, Mark was talking about how his dad helped him to decide on communications. What makes NASA so great today is we learned how to communicate. Um, we, we started going like that 
when we brought in young people who understood social media and, and that kind of stuff. And so I, I would put NASA up against any organization in the world today in terms of ability to communicate and tell their story because we don't, engineers do not tell good stories. And we've got, we have to learn how because it's critical. Mm -hmm. uh, for engineers and scientists and everybody to be storytellers. Yeah. So. so, of course, you all know the old adage about engineers, that how you tell an uh, introverted from an extroverted engineer, that the uh, extroverted engineer spends the, uh, the introverted engineer, no, the extroverted engineer spends the party looking at your shoes, <laughs> and then the introverted one spends the party looking at his shoes. <laughs> But actually, if you're a scientist or a physicist, you find that engineers have the outgoing personalities. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Mark. <laughs> so let's kind of <laughs> step away for a moment, just from, from space, towards your field of biotechnology, because that's a big uh, focus here and focus of investment here. You know, the Cleveland Clinic has the top-ranked heart program in the United States, and you steer cardiovascular innovation efforts there. Now, you also had a long career as an executive in industry, including a number of biomedical startups, uh, bringing bi uh, medical technologies, you know, breakthrough technologies to market. So how do industry and academic hospitals ideally work together in generating biomedical breakthroughs and bringing them into use through the market. Well, that's something that we're looking at all the time, mm -hmm. and it's evolving. But you have to have both. Actually, I think there are three things you have to have. You need to have the academic medical center. You have to have industry. But you also need research technology institutes like this one. And I think that there are three different components to the, uh, the uh, successful triangle. triangle. That's right. First thing is you got to have a common need that you're trying to solve. And in medical, it's what are the unmet needs? And you need to be able to articulate those and, and qualify those, and you'll be able to set that as a, an objective. And then you have to figure out, OK, what's going to make a difference in how you approach those needs? And what makes a difference today is evolving and is very different from what made a difference when I first started out. Healthcare systems and uh, the financing of healthcare uh, is, is changing remarkably now. And what were the incentives and what were the measures earlier are no longer. Value based care, population based care, treating chronic disease and more than acute episodes of disease, it's all changing. And so, how do you know, the various constituents and the solution providers come together to figure out what to do? I do believe that a collaboration among those three sources, resources, uh, is, is the answer. And I believe that the hospital, the academic medical center, comes with the patients and with the needs for the efficient delivery of care to patients in a changing environment and in a very low margin environment. Industry. Uh, has evolved. You mentioned Medtronic. You know, Medtronic, Boston Scientific, St. Jude, Abbott, all have kind of moved away from doing a lot of the early technology development. That's true. So that innovation isn't happening in industry, but they know how to develop and to manufacture and to commercialize the technologies. So then the third leg of the stool is an institution like this that's going to bring new technology to the table and is going to be able to provide answers to solve these problems of how do we measure, how do we monitor, how do we change, uh, how do we regenerate all of the things that, that medical products do these days and what kinds of technologies can we bring to the table? So not one of those, I think, is going to be successful in doing new innovation. But together, and with the appropriate stake in the game for each one, so that all contributes, all bears some risk, each bears some risk, 
and then each has an opportunity to benefit from the upside is how that kind of uh, collaboration should go. Well, I also often say that there's no innovation without innovators, and we're in the business of educating. There you go. Now, talking about uh, industry, you know, President Obama believed that uh, private industry had an important role in the next frontiers of our exploration of space, and, and he fostered a burgeoning spaceflight industry after the end of the space shuttle program. Now, NASA's always worked with contractors, but how has the advent of charismatic entrepreneurs such as Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Richard Branson changed the possibilities of space flight and exploration and public support for it? I, I will say one thing first, and that's, um, I think NASA opened the door uh, a charismatic person without an agency like NASA that was willing to change the paradigm, uh, to make the paradigm shift as we did in 2009 when President Obama came in, that said, okay, we're going to do something different. You know, we, we just can't afford to continue to do things the way we do it. We're not utilizing the, the, the best that, that America has or that, that we have internationally. Um, what the charismatic guys brought other than their bank book their checkbook, uh, that's important because, as Mark said, um, everybody's got to be willing to put some skin in the game. And so what we did when we introduced commercial space was um, we came up with a system where you ignored con normal contracting, and we went to something called an other trans... Any lawyers in here? <laughs> other transactional authority, which means... It's we a have one in here, but he's it, hiding. It's a contract, but it's not a contract, <laughs> and, and what it says is... Okay, you go off and you bring us a product that meets these requirements. We're not going to tell you how to suck eggs. You know, you, we're not going to tell you make it green or anything like that or make it long. But you also have to put some money in the game. We're going to give you this amount, and then you can go off. If you want to build a gazillion-dollar widget, fine. If you want to just use our money to build that widget and you can do that, fine. And so that's where we are with commercial space today. It, it's a... Um, everybody has skin in the game. Everybody doesn't win. Uh, that's the other thing. So it puts, it puts a real sense of competition into it. The competition today, the, the, you know, it's not nations anymore. It's, it's companies. Uh, it's Blue Origin versus SpaceX versus uh, Grumman, uh, on and on and on. And, um, and, and it's incredibly exciting and, um, and, and a a very positive time. I think we're going to do really good things. Yeah. So before we close out, we have time for a few questions. Or does anyone from the uh, audience have a question? Please. Uh, there's a mic. Uh, could you help him with them? I had uh, two conversations with George Lowe when he was here, um, and I was a student. Um, he invited me and a few hundred uh, other international students to the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the Saturday after the start of freshman year. And I met him for maybe a minute, probably more like 30 seconds, as he worked the entire room. Uh, walking across campus the next year, <laughs> I passed him. He stopped me, addressed me by name, and asked me how I was. The reason that George Lowe was so famous amongst the students is acts like that. He was a remarkable uh, leader, of course, and uh, uh, that skill, so my question uh, is for Dr. Jackson, that personal skill is probably one of the defining factors of great leaders. They have remarkable ability to, uh, to do things like that, for many of them anyways. What can the school do in the next generation of engineers and scientists to build that type of leadership capacity? Well, I think we're doing a, a, a number of things. Uh, the first is that you know we are working very hard to transform the fundamental student experience from uh, 
how we bring them in to how we nurture and uh, move them along and help them develop and support them as they move along. Now, each president has his or her own way of how the students are introduced to the university that's both personal and systemic. And so I personally greet every student, uh, all, in this case, 1,700 of them. Uh, I shake the hand of every freshman at the top of the approach. Um, and we just did that. I just did that a couple of weeks ago. And my whole leadership team is there, uh, all of the vice presidents and the deans, so people understand that the leadership here cares about them. And then we actually welcome them to the city of Troy. And the mayor comes to greet them and welcome them. And then we're there as well, and I spend time with them, as do the other leaders. But then we also work very hard to have them uh, bond with each other, which is why we created Navigating Rensselaer and Beyond, so that the students spend time together exploring and learning about uh, the university, about Troy, and about the greater area, which will be their home for at least four years and for some students longer. And then we've uh, worked hard to uh, visit with students where they live, but in addition to uh, have more human touch in the form of live-in deans and to do programming in the uh, residence halls to help students, again, bond with each other and interact and uh, discuss things and, and grow. And then we've evolved all of this to class, the clustered learning advocacy and support for students to really break down the barriers. Um, you know, one of the findings is that students these days are more lonely. And so we spend a lot of time trying to think about that and, and, and what we can do. Our faculty as well are, are very caring and spend a, a great deal of time with the students, and not only in teaching them from the intellectual perspective, but uh, helping them to grow as they move along their professional paths. And so I would say it's a whole of university effort um, because it takes many hands and many <coughs> touches to uh, not just help students over the humps they may face, but to actually help young people who are extremely talented and want to make a difference, to grow in the ways that matter for them and will help them to do what they want. And so that whole of university effort is what we actually refer to as, as class. And so, so it's a different time you know, with different students, with different expectations and different needs. And so we try to meet those needs in multiple ways at multiple levels and uh, with multiple hands, including mine. And so that's what I would say. Now, you know, we could talk more specifically about some of the, you know, specific programming that we do. But in a nutshell, that really describes what we do. And, you know, our our deans are engaged, they're very charismatic, and, and they see to it that their schools uh, nurture the, sc the students in the same way. You know, we've heard over the years of experiences that students have that, you know, made them feel less than welcome. And I would say that doesn't happen anymore. And we're much more intentional about how we uh, help the young people grow and the support we provide for them academically, but in the personal way as well. Is there another? Uh, Robert. So, so thank you very much for a fascinating conversation. Um, so I guess when we look back 50 or 60 years, I mean, the Apollo program seems like a technological marvel. Um, for my calculation, I mean, the moon landing happened before we had the first 
commercial handheld calculator. Um, so I guess, Major General Bolden, you have undoubtedly an encyclopedic knowledge of the history of NASA. Mm -mm. Uh, yeah. OK. <laughs> uh, uh, how I, I wish. <laughs> all right, well, let's say you have a knowledge of the history of NASA. <laughs> Mr. Lowe, you must know your father as well as anybody on the planet. So, so my question is, what was the biggest challenge? What was the great unknown that, that, that bloomed uh, in face of a successful moon landing? I mean, what was it which kept your father awake at night, Mr. Lowe, as, uh, as this extraordinary program unfolded? Besides this rebellious kid? <laughs> <laughs> no. You know, I'm, I have the same question. Frankly, you know, I'm looking at, at the time that some of these visions were articulated and actually translated into plans. And there's this one uh, memo that was written in October of 1960. The copy of it's in the, uh, in, on display in the gallery, and, and I've got it in my office. Um, Time for a uh, plan for how we're going to get to the moon. I'm paraphrasing, but there's one paragraph in there. It's only 165 words long, this whole thing, which has been called the birth certificate of the Apollo program. And the date on it was six months before we had ever put anybody into space. And it was before there were calculators and computers, and it was... And I can't conceive how anyone really had the vision to be able to say, there's a way to do that. And we can develop the way to do that. And we can do it in the time frame that we're laying out here. And to me, that... Uh, willingness to take on a challenge like that is, you know, special. I don't know that it's unique, but it's certainly special, you know, looking at some of the SpaceX and, and other, you know, initiatives that are going on today. But what kept them up at night, I think, was probably tackling each step of the way and making sure that what was on the dock, docket was being addressed. When there were setbacks, it was how do we address that and get back on track. When the lunar module wasn't ready for Apollo 8, what can we do with what we know and what we've got, but to move the program forward and to just try and stay on track? Let's go to the moon without a lunar module. So. I think it's um, relentless approach to tackling problems and knocking them down and moving on to the next one. Charlie, anything you want to add? I, you know, there is a mis, um, off misused quote from Apollo 13 that came from Gene Kranz is attributed with having said failure is not an option. And uh, so people think that that, that defines NASA. And, and it, he didn't mean what people now think it means, that you cannot fail. Uh, what he meant was sort of like, like Mark was saying his dad was, Gene Kranz was the same person who was at Rice, Rice Stadium on the day that President Kennedy said, you know, before the decade is over, we're going to send a man to the moon and bring him safely home. Gene said all of... All the people he knew from NASA went home saying the president's lost his mind. <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't know how to do that. But, but he says they all woke up the next morning and they said, nope, he, he's got it. We don't know how to do it. But we will figure out how. And that's all Gene was telling people in the mission control room when he closed and locked the doors and said nobody's leaving here because failure is not an option. We are not going to lose this crew. Um, it's really important for us when we work with young people, help them understand that failure is a part of the option. If we want to be successful down the road, if we want to advance, 
we've got to be risk takers and we've got to be willing uh, to do things that other people say you can't do or you shouldn't do. You've got to be rebellious. You know, somebody's got to go under the water because it's, <laughs> it's the last frontier now, to be quite honest. It is one of the last frontiers. But, but we've got to help people understand that, yeah, in the, in the long game, failure is not an option, not for humanity. Uh, but in order to get where we want to be, we have got to be willing to take risk. We've got to be willing to fail and learn from it. Uh, otherwise, why do we do anything? I, I think there are two other kinds of uh, lessons. One is that things don't just kind of spring out of thin air. I mean, if you really think about uh, uh, all of the work that was done, and both scientifically and in an engineering way, in terms of the effort in the war, in World War II, uh, the communication technologies that were developed, the computational capabilities that were developed, uh, early you know, materials work that was done, uh, propulsion systems that were developed. Some things we even learned from the Germans. And, and all of those things we're all part of being able to have all of these pieces to put together to create a successful Apollo program. In addition, uh, no, we didn't have the kind of power we have on our, you know, iPhones or whatever today. But that's why the question about the hidden figures is important. Because on the one hand, you were using the human mind and human talent. You were using basic physical principles, you know, because that's what in the end you're using to calculate tra trajectories, to know where the Lagrange points are, and so on, to, to know how you shift the, the trajectories. And then somebody then has to organize and pull all of that together and, and make it work. And that's part, a lot of what we've been talking about today. And that was the genius of, of George Lowe. But he even understood that it was built, you know, within the framework and on the back of all of this work that had gone on before. And I think that's an important point for us not to lose in, in talking with our students because it takes that virtual village. And, and so I think that's important. And then I think uh, to Charlie's point that things are not without risk you know, uh, he and I lost a good friend, Ron McNair, uh, when the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up. But Ron, more than anybody, understood the risk and, and that he was pushing the edge of the envelope and that he could lose his life at any time, which unfortunately he did. But he never regretted uh, what he did. But there's another lesson having to do with how these things get pulled together. And we saw it in the Space Shuttle Challenger, and that is that you can never be arrogant and you can never lose sight of the smallest things mm -hmm. because in the end, that's what caused the, the Challenger to blow up, the smallest things. Is there a, another question? Yeah. Please. So uh, kind of going back on that last point that you were talking about, with the new space, with uh, SpaceX uh, Blue Origin, is that kind of like a challenge to uh, Lowe's philosophy of being very meticulous about everything? And is there more of like a risk with doing it that way? Just kind of trying with like the new philosophy on SpaceX, which is fast and quick. Oh, the SpaceX. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think I understand the question. They, you know, like everything, they, they're learning. They, they have been fortunate, unfortunate, but fortunate to have had uh, a couple of accidents from which to learn and, um, or a couple of close calls from which to learn. And every time, every time that happens, you get a little bit smarter and you recognize the fact that we were talking about configuration control. They do a lot more, they pay a lot more attention to configuration control today than they than they did the very first time they launched. They spend a lot, pay a lot more attention to software verification and validation than they did their first flight, 
when some fuel valves and things didn't open because they thought that, why do we need to do that? Uh, we're pretty smart. So I think people learn by making mistakes and, and you try to, try to grow from it. But um, I, I'm impressed by what they do. Uh, they, they're two, when you talk about SpaceX and, and Blue Origin, those are the two that a lot of people talk about today because they have, they have founders who are diametrically different in personality, if you, you know, alone. One's, a, an, one's an introvert, the other one is just bubbly and outgoing. And, um, um, and I'll let you figure out which one is which because it, <laughs> because it, is, it is not obvious, as a matter of fact. Um, and they have a different approach to, to the way that they do business, but they'll both get where they're going. I, I kind of call it the tortoise and the hare. But it, it's fun to watch that kind of competition today. Competition for ideas and competition you know, within, within companies as opposed to nations and the like. There's always competition in nations. Well, I go back to what uh, Mark said. I do think it takes the triangle or the three-legged stool. Yep. Um, I, I think what uh, the, the sort of charismatic uh, characters <laughs> and their companies bring is to shake people out of, mm -hmm. you know, kind of set ideas. But in the end, it, it takes a lot of hard work lot of and, and uh, basic work and, and organization. And uh, because as you and I both know, uh, Charlie, uh, we have to think about new kinds of propulsion systems alone to, to go to Mars. And so that, that's a different place than where you know, where we are today with some of the commercial things. So I want to thank all of you um, for uh, joining us and, and for your attention. But as we close out, let me just say this. We expect our students today to be the leaders, you know, with wherever we're going next in, in space, in biotechnology, in any number of fields. And they're going to be doing it as the scientific researchers, engineers, uh, astronauts, uh, managers, entrepreneurs. So what would each of you like to leave with uh, any of our students who are in the audience and maybe their parents um, in terms of what they should dream about, think about, hope for? Um, Mark? So I think first step is you got to put yourself in the right position. And I think anybody that's here has already made that good first step. So choosing to come here is and get your education here and to work here and to research here uh, puts you already in a inquisitive and an exploratory mindset. And, and I think that's the first thing. I think the next thing is you got to think bold. you got to think large. The examples that we've talked about today, you know, were kind of off the charts, you know, bold and, and out there. But you can approach it in, in smaller ways. And I think the question that I would ask each student to, to ask themselves is, you know, if you see something that has a limit, or if you see something that is uh, an opportunity, ask yourself the question, what if? What if there wasn't this cost constraint? What if there wasn't this technical constraint? What if there wasn't this time spent to do this? What could we do to solve that problem? And how can we uh, invent new approaches to uh, find a solution that you might not have thought of otherwise. So continuing to question and to ask, break it down and ask what if, and then I think great opportunities and, and directions will come from that. Charlie? I, I think another thing is, you know, everybody has a passion. Um, nobody knows what that passion is for you other than you. Um, try to identify it as soon as you can. Um, science is not the only way. Science and engineering is not the only way to be involved in space. I, I include the A uh, in STEAM. I, I don't talk about STEM anymore. 
Uh, the arts are critically important, and you can even add a D on the end, which is design. So for every one of you in here who has any interest in the space program, if that's what you're, where your passion, you think your passion is, particularly if you're a, a young kid, and I, I saw a couple, I think, but if you're a parent of a young kid, encourage them to do, to follow their passion. Uh, become very good at, at some one thing and, and just follow it doggedly uh, and pursue it until you become the best person in the world at what that is. Whether you get there or not is really not important. It's the, it's the road to getting to be, trying to be the best person in the world at what you do. And then the, the last thing I would tell you in this world today is um, take care of your people. As you become a leader, or whether it's a company or, a, or you're a, a supervisor of one or two people, take care of your people and, uh, and they'll take care of you. If you're worried about yourself, you're lost anyway. So um, I think that that would be what I would tell you. So I want to make one comment to the general. So you talk about putting the A in STEM. A lot of people talk about that. I just want to remind you that you are sitting in the Curtis R. Prem Experimental Media and Performing Arts <laughs> Center, which represents the true nexus of science technology, the arts, and design. Thank all of you. Let us thank our... Thank